it is a part of the Islamic religion to be obedient. The Quran tells Muslims to be very obedient to Muhammad and to Allah. Um, the entire religion is often learned in paradigms of authority. And so it's not really a part of the traditional Islamic perspective to question what you've learned. Um, that it seems to be, and I'm not saying nobody questions, I'm not saying Muslims are mindless, but the tradition generally doesn't encourage questioning. Uh, and so Muslims often have a lot of comfort questioning the New Testament manuscripts, like you said, but not necessarily the Quran. One thing where I want to start, whenever I talk about the environment in which the Quran uh, was composed, I start by saying this. There was no such thing as Arabic literature during the time of the Quran. Let me let, no me, let me understand that. So because I, I, th- my understanding is there was poets, but are these non-writing poets? Exactly. It's all oral tradition. So by the time you have the Quran, the most you have in terms of Arabic writing, it's been about 100 years before that when they've developed um, Arabic uh, text. Um, Arabic script. Uh, It hasn't been formalized yet. It hasn't been codified yet. Uh, Before that, whenever someone wanted to write Arabic, they would use foreign scripts like Nabataean scripts. That was a language in the north of Arabia. So about the 500s, they start developing an Arabic script and they've only used it on uh, on funerary inscriptions, so on tombs. Uh, Some people are using it for receipts, uh, for transactions. But no one's writing whole books with it. Uh, Arabic hasn't gotten to that point yet. And so when the Quran comes, it has to, by definition, because of the way the Arabic language is, it has to, by definition, be an oral text. Uh, Unless they, at the exact same time the Quran comes, invent a way to write Arabic and codify it and standardize it. Uh, They did not. And so primarily, the Quran was oral. It was relayed orally. It was understood orally. This is why Muhammad was able to say, uh, I'm sorry, I should be more fair. This is why the Quran is able to say uh, in chapter 2, verse 106, in chapter 16, verse 101, it says, does not Allah have the ability to cause people to forget his previous revelations and to give them new ones? Now, what this verse is saying is that portions of the Quran can be abrogated. They can just be removed from the record and new ones can be given. Now, we often ask the question, how is that possible? If you have a written text, how is it possible that you'd have someone just remove sections of that text and add new sections? And the answer is, it wasn't written. This is why it says Allah can cause you to forget. This was stuff that was remembered in people's minds. The Quran was primarily in people's minds. Now, there is a hadith um, about uh, um, the the certain verses being written down on animal bones and on palm leaf stalks, that should give you an idea of of how this stuff was written when it was written. It was scratched onto uh, items that were lying around, more or less, um, and it wasn't intended to capture the whole text. I have a question. They didn't have the technology to do it. About that. So I've often wondered about that because um, I don't believe we need to be like radical revisionists and questioning every single thing that the the uh, the Quran says about general Islamic history or the more reliable Hadith. However, there's also some basic questions I feel like really haven't been analyzed enough in regards to them within the sort of accepted story of how things came about. What I mean is bones. I was thinking about this recently. What kind of bones can we write on? What do we write on them with? Is there evidence within the Arabian Peninsula that other people use this as a means to write things down? How much could you write? What parts of an animal's bones would you write on? Which animals would be desirable to write on? Do you see? And have we ever found any Quranic inscriptions on animal bones? I, do you know the answer to any of those questions? Because to me, those are very interesting, and I just wonder if they've ever been explored by anybody. Um, the bones in particular that I've heard, uh, I'm not sure what the evidence is for this, but the bones in particular that I've heard were shoulder blades. And so if you consider a scapula, there is a flat area upon which you can write. Um, but uh, you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, this is not the desired method for writing. Um, By the time the Qurans were ultimately more codified, we do see Muslims using vellum. Now, vellum is a very expensive material um, that involves uh, slaughtering animals and preparing the skin uh, as a material on which to write. Um, To to make one Quran out of vellum, we're talking about about whole herds of sheep that would have to be killed or goats. Um, So 
But that comes when Muslims have wealth. That comes when Muslims have the ability to uh, to, to 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 take these kinds of measures. Um, that's not early on in Islamic history. So when we're talking about during Muhammad's life, uh, even from the Quranic records, and this is what I want to convey. This isn't something some Christian is saying. The Islamic records indicate that the Quran was primarily oral. It wasn't until Uthman codified it in a text that it became primarily written. Until that time, you had people disagreeing on how to say texts. You had something called the Ahruf, where Muhammad would reveal a verse in one way, and then he'd reveal the same verse in another way to somebody else. Those two people would argue, and they would come before Muhammad and say, look, he, he's, he's saying it wrong. And then Muhammad would say, no, 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 that's good enough. Um, that's how oral this text was. It, it wasn't intended to be with the same kind of verbatim precision with which we understand written texts. The that differences during the time of Uthman. Were these differences dialect? Because whenever I hear somebody explain the Uthmanic recension to me, they say it was just to put it into a certain dialect. No, because, well, here, I, I certainly don't think so. Um, and primarily because vocalizations are where dialectical differences are, are often found. And no one had developed vocalizations by this point. All you had was the consonantal Rusam text. But beyond that, we do have a record in the Hadith of the kinds of differences there were. Um, and uh, Muhammad says, look, as long as you don't substitute justice for mercy or mercy for justice, say it however you learned it. Is that in the, Hadith? Words, Is that in the Hadith? That's in the Hadith. Is that in a, like an acceptable, you know, the one with the strong is not chain or one that somebody may say, oh, that's weak? I'd have to look up exactly where that one is, um, but that's that's not found in just one place, by okay. the way. It's found okay. in many places. Right. Um, and uh, I also have heard both Sunni and Shia scholars quote that hadith. Okay. okay. Um, so this is this is the nature of the Islamic text early on. Uh, the Ahruf are different from the Kirat. Now, a lot of Muslims will try to present the two as if they're the same. The Kirat are the different dialects, the different ways to read the same text. The Ahruf were certainly not that. Um, and, and most people don't understand that. Very few, even Sunni scholars, would say that the two were the same. They're not. So it wasn't until about 20 years after Muhammad that you have somebody saying, hey, let's collect all of these records of the Quranic text, destroy them all, and put out one official version. So you have a very intentional effort to control the text of the Quran. And was this because I've I've told there's a different amount of collections. Was this collection you're speaking of prior to the battle where a lot of the the men who had memorized the Quran died, or is this right after it? This is about twenty years later. So Muhammad dies in six thirty two AD. The Battle of Yamama, which you're referring to, it was one of the major apostate wars. Most hey, hold people on. don't know this either, but <laughs> when Muhammad dies Hey, uh, did you say the Battle of Yamama? <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, I know. What I did mean, you say about my mama? <laughs> and how about it's a battle of your mama, Nabil? <laughs> what'd you say? <laughs> yeah, what'd you say? <laughs> sorry, man. I'm sorry. So in, in Islam, when Muhammad dies, many tribes try to leave Islam. That's pretty telling. Uh, the moment he dies, a lot, a lot of tribes are, are trying to leave Islam. Specifically, they no longer want to pay. They don't want to pay money. Um, and Abu Bakr um, sends out Khalid bin Walid and a bunch of other people to fight them and make sure they stay Muslim. Uh, one of those battles was this battle. And in this battle, uh, different numbers are given, but it's, it's also said that 500 people who knew the Quran very well were sent into this battle. And why is that? Well, chapter 15 of the Quran says that Allah will guard the Quran. Mm -hmm. So uh, people believed, hey, if we have the Quran memorized, Allah will protect us. Well, didn't happen. A bunch of them died. And so Starting from that moment, certain people were worried that large portions of the Quran would be lost. Right. Uh, and um, when, you, when you look at the way the Quran was ultimately written down, we do have records of certain verses of the Quran that were only found with one person. Right. So it's quite possible, even from the records that are included, uh, that, hey, if that guy hadn't still been there, those verses would have been lost. Maybe there were tons of other verses that were lost. Um, 
the records leave leave no uh, indication that there was any protection against large sections being lost. All right. When I was debating Shadid, I asked him about the section of the Quran that Aisha says uh, uh, an animal snuck into the tent and ate this section. And and now there is a, a it looked like she was saying a sura that was gone forever because it was only there. That's my understanding. When I asked Shadid Lewis about that, he said that was this is my understanding of what he was saying back to me. Essentially, that was the method that Allah chose to abrogate that section. Yeah. <laughs> Abrogate. <laughs> oh, hey. That, so you've heard this because you had a pre-planned pun. <laughs> but here's what's funny about that. I did one, too, because I hadn't heard it before. I said, bro, that's not abrogation. That's digestion. But but, <laughs> but, but yours is a lot better. Oh, man. <laughs> so help me out. Yeah. With, help me out with that, though. Help us out. Well, I mean, it, <laughs> gosh, the early Muslim records didn't seem to have a problem with recording the fact that sections were lost. Even if you look in Sahih Bukhari. Now, I want any Muslim who's hearing this to just read Book 61 of Sahih Bukhari. Uh, it's the book about the collection of the Quran. It's very clear about Muhammad saying and Allah saying uh, that people would forget large sections of the Quran. Right. Not people will forget them and Allah will save them from forgetting it. No, it's no. People do forget sections of the Quran. Um, and this is one of those cases where uh, in this, in Sunan Ibn Majah, I think the Hadith number is 1944, but don't correct me. Uh, don't, don't check me on that one, but oh, I'm sorry, don't quote me on that. I got you. Um, there, she is saying, look, we got this verse right before Muhammad died and uh, a goat came in and ate it. A domestic animal came in and ate it. Um, that's in the records. Why would that be in a Muslim record? Unless it happened, why would any Muslim want to make that up and put it in their own books of Hadith? So I, I do think that these records are telling us something. We need to consider these carefully. All right. So um, do Muslim scholars talk about this? That's what I wonder, because I have trouble finding honest and open discussions by Islamic historians. And even I, I just don't know how many Islamic textual critics exist See, this is the trouble. If I want to like talk to Dan Wallace and find his stuff or get another perspective, Bart Ehrman or from yesteryear, go to Tischendorf, you know, Bruce Metzger. It's easy as, you know, boom, boom, boom. I mean, it's in our commentaries. There's little text. But what do I do if I want to find out about an Islamic textual history? I mean, do I just got to read a bunch of Hadith? Who exists? Who talks about this? You know, that's, that's a great question. And more and more people are, praise God. Um it's, uh, it was something that was more common early on in Islamic history. So very, very early on, people saw it as a form of piety to record the differences in these Quranic texts. So you had three sources early on in Islamic history that I would call uh, textual critics. You had Ibn Nadim's Fihrist, you had Asiyuti's Itqan Fi Ilum Al-Quran, and then you had Ibn Abi Dawud's Kitab al-Masahif. I would say Ibn Abi Dawud's Kitab al-Masahif was the most careful out of the three. It was the most uh, thorough. And it was lost. Uh, I can't say I'm surprised. Given the way Muslims ultimately treated the Quran, I'm not at all surprised that his work was ultimately lost to the pages of history. Fortunately, we have since found two copies. Um, uh, Arthur Jeffries found the first, a Westerner that was respected by many Muslims. But recently, a Muslim scholar has found a copy. And it records the differences between the Qurans of Muhammad's companions. Two of those companions were Abdullah ibn Masud and Ubay ibn Qab. Muhammad had chosen those two as the best teachers of the Quran. And we have a record kept by Muslims, found by Muslims, of the differences between their Qurans. Fascinating stuff. I hope that this gets developed more in the near future. All right. So the, what's... So we're talking about this, but the thing is, I want someone who's like, whoa, I just heard a lot of words I don't understand. You just jumped into like the text behind the text. What's sort of the payoff for this? Because we're not saying that because there's an actual history to the chronic text, therefore it's false necessarily. I want people to know what we're saying, because I think on one front, we're trying to dispel some popular notions that a lot of uh, Muslims have. And then on another hand, I think we're trying to talk about maybe some theological implications. Help me understand like the cash value of this discussion. That's great. And I, I, I do want to make sure we, we set those boundaries. Number right. one, 
Um, I'm not saying that the Quran's message has been entirely changed. Um, that's not what I'm saying. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I'm saying that a lot of these things we're talking about are common to all books in history. Um, so that's point number one. Point number two, when I'm talking about Abdullah ibn Masud and Ubay ibn Kaab, what I'm saying is that the earliest Muslims did not agree as to what goes into the Quran. Because it was oral, whenever they recited it orally, they didn't have to draw boundaries. It wasn't until they wrote it down when some people said, wait a minute, why are you including that section? Um, why are you leaving this section out? So when the Quran was written down, some of the Muslims who Muhammad chose to, to, to relay the tradition of the Quran, they disagreed with the stuff that goes in the Quran. That's point number two. Point number three. A lot of Muslims, I myself, uh, 15 years ago, would have argued that not a single letter has been added into the Quran. Nothing has been added. Uh, fact of the matter is, uh, in one very specific time in history, a man added 2,000 olives to the Quran. Hold on, hold on. So, well, I don't help. What do you actually mean by that? A man added 2,000 olives. What do you mean? Uh, there was a standardization process to the Quran. Are you talking about Uthman now? No, this is not Uthman. This is after Uthman. Okay. Um, I'm forgetting who it was. If it was uh, Ibn Malik or it might have been Ibn Malik, but I'm not sure exactly who it was. But 2,000 olives. This is not anything that Muslim scholars disagree with. You can ask a Muslim scholar. Um, added 2,000 olives to the Quran. That's one. Ibn Mujahid uh, in the third century after Muhammad, um, he said, hey, everyone, stop reading all these different things. Uh, recitations of the Quran, we're going to limit it to seven. Uh, and then ultimately he increased that number to 10. Um, and then each of those 10 different ways of reading the Quran had eight different recitations. So by the time 1924 rolled around, you had 80 different recitations of the Quran in common use. Um, now, now, were they all different in meaning? No. But my point is that there were slightly different meanings in those and so we cannot by any means say the thing that many Muslims say, which is that the Quran has always been exactly the same. There's never been any changes, never been any variants. All of them have always been the same. No, that's a very popular misconception, and it's demonstrably false. The Aleph is the, the lengthening uh, long A sound. So how would it, would it just change the way you pronounce things? Because I've never heard this before, so I'm trying to just understand. So in some cases, yeah. For example, if you have, uh, you know, an Aleph in a text, you know what the text means anyway. But in other cases, there, there are going to be changes in meaning. For example, the difference between Malik and Malik. Uh, one means king and one means owner. The difference is an Aleph. Oh, okay. um, so you have, you do have differences in meaning based on these things. Um, in the different Qur'at, for example, the, the, the most common Qur'an, Quran used today, over 95% of the Qur'ans you'll find, are Hafs an Asim. 3% of the other Qur'an, uh, the remaining Qur'ans, 3% of those are um, Warsh an Nafi. These Qur'ans more or less say the same thing, but in certain occasions they will say different things. So, for example, when it will say uh, in the second person uh, plural, you, uh, where, whereas in other places it will say in the third person plural, they, um, so th there will be differences in meaning found in these texts for sure. All right. So theologically, does this matter for Islamic theology, this discussion? It matters in terms of uh, Muslims often thinking they have basically a faxed copy of what's in heaven in front of them. Right. Uh, and that nothing has ever changed. That's false. Uh, the Quran is a much more natural document than that. It's not so supernatural as that it's never been changed. Every document in history has textual variants. Anytime someone records anything, they're going to make mistakes unless it's a Xerox machine. Uh, and so the Quran is just like every other book in that regards. That does make a difference theologically. Do we have any pre-Uthmanic recension Qurans? You know, there's this uh, Birmingham Quran right. controversy. Right. Um, so we may. I tend to think that it demonstrates uh, a form of Arabic that is later than Uthman, um, but I, I do have to admit I'm biased, um, so maybe I'm reading my biases into that. Um, yeah, just, just so you know, recently a Quran was found in Birmingham. Uh, it was a manuscript we knew about for a while, but had been mixed in with other folios. Uh, they did some carbon dating on it, and the carbon dating came back to 
from before the time of Muhammad to just after him. There's always a range given with right. carbon dates. Yeah. Um, and they, they say this is probably from the time of Muhammad. Uh, I think that's problematic because carbon dating never dates the written text. It right. dates the paper on which it's been written. So that's the, Just so everyone understands, what he's saying is the, the dating they did with carbon dating dates the material that it was written on, but that's not telling you when this is a, anachronistic pen was put to paper, so to speak. Exactly. So that's more through paleography. Now, has that happened yet? And how developed is Arabic paleography? It really can't be because they don't have any Arabic literature. And that's the point. When you have paleography, paleography is the study of handwriting. Handwriting often changes from place to place, decade to decade. So you can therefore look back and say, ah, this kind of handwriting was at this time in this place. Right. Um, but since there was no Arabic literature at the time, we don't have the ability to do that. Uh, and I do want to point this out to Muslim friends who might be listening. Um, Arabic was a very poor choice for Allah. If he was going to send a message he wanted to be perfectly preserved, why send it to a language that didn't really have a good codified system of writing? Why not send it in Greek, for example, which has been written for over a thousand years before then? Dang, those sound like fighting words. Because I know I'm some. <laughs> I'm just saying. I mean, it's common sense. Well, you alluded to this, and uh, I mean, you can draw this out as much as uh, you have time for, but uh, you were saying uh, proving that there are textual variants to the Quran has some theological implications. I mean, could you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, Muslims uh, often think that the Quran it has innate evidence that it's inspired. Uh, let's not forget that when Muhammad was asked to give reason why we should believe in Islam. He pointed to the Quran. He said, the Quran is my reason why. Um, and many Muslims think because of chapter 15, I think it's verse 91, that the Quran will never be changed. Um, and uh, the fact of the matter is, the Quran does have these changes in it. Uh, and so if your confidence in Islam is built on the perfect preservation of the Quran, um, that's going to prove problematic for you, just like it did for me a decade ago. I, that was my main reason for being Muslim. At the end of the day, um, I thought the Quran was the inspired word of God. And when I realized it had all these changes and differences in it, it really shook my confidence. And, and the truth should be pursued no matter what it does to your confidence. Wow. Well, that is good. And then great question to end. Um, a few resources I could recommend. The problem is they're sort of, I don't know, I don't want to say high-minded, but you know, there's Keith Small's book about the Quranic uh, manuscripts. It's really good, but it's just it's kind of hard for your first reading to start in this topic. Um, another one that's also difficult if it's going to be your first book is a book called uh, Muhammad is Not the Father of Any of your, These Men. I forgot the author's name. He's from uh, Pennsylvania, but uh, I'm sure you're familiar with that book. That's a good one. And then a uh, more recent and maybe a little uh, easier to start with is called The Gentle Answer uh, by Gordon Nickel to the Muslim Accusation of Biblical Falsification. And there's one particular section of this book. This book just came out. And I think it's a, probably a great place to stay, start. It's mainly section three that deals with some of these issues we've been discussing. And of course, Nabil, you got a great lecture online, at least that I've heard uh, from the Biola uh, thing on iTunes that's really good on this as well. Anything else you'd recommend as we close out this show? I have a very brief section of it uh, on this and Seeking Allah, Finding Jesus. And right now I'm writing my next book, which has a much larger section All right. uh, on the textual uh, issues of the Quran. That book will come out in August of 2016. It's called uh, No God But One, Allah or Jesus. Excellent, exciting stuff. Well, Nabil, thank you so much for joining us today.